All right, welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast, episode 87. If you are listening to this on the podcast app or anywhere where you get your podcasts, you might not know that I've started putting the video version over on the Simple Farmhouse Life YouTube channel. So if you do wanna see the video version, you can do that. I just decided that since I am just sitting here talking to a camera, I might as well roll the video. It's basically the exact same editing, nothing changes. It's a little bit um, harder for me because this means I have to put on makeup, whereas before this was something I could record at any time and now I have to look a little bit more presentable. Now that's of course optional. There will be times when I don't. So <laughs> this is what I'm at least thinking to do for now. It's been a couple weeks since I've shared an episode. I just have gotten behind on pretty much everything. So I'm ready to at least jump back in for this week. I can't exactly guarantee, but what I'm gonna share today is five new things that I've learned in my kitchen. Things that I'm cooking maybe a little bit differently. I have a whole little list here of things that are new that I haven't yet shared about on here or maybe just my blog, so let's dive in. My name is Lisa, mom of six and creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. This episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast is sponsored by the Blogging Success Masterclass. In this one hour free training, I teach you some of the common mistakes that people make when trying to start a blog, how to earn money, how to get an audience. You can find that at bit.ly forward slash farmhouse blogging school. That's bit.ly forward slash farmhouse blogging school. Okay, the first one is how I make sourdough bread. So this is a post that has gone up over on the blog. It is going to hit YouTube with a full explanation video where I walk you through all of the steps. But I do already have the ingredients and the methods over on the blog post. It's just some people do like that visual direction a little bit better, so it will be hitting the YouTube channel. But I'm gonna walk you through this new method here on my podcast as well in case some of you just want to start implementing it that way. So I have been making sourdough bread for about 10 years now. And the way that I've always done it up till now is basically just making bread, but with sourdough as opposed to yeast. So the same exact recipe methods, kneading it until it gets stretchy and passes the window pane test with basic ingredients like salt, water, maybe some honey, some wheat or flour, and sourdough starter and water. But I started seeing a lot of different methods over on Instagram, YouTube, and I didn't really know exactly what people were doing. I saw them stretching and folding, making really cool designs, and this is just something that I never tried. I've always just made bread the common, usual way that people make bread, where you knead it till it gets stretchy, allow it to do a long first rise, punch it down, shape it, second rise, bake. That's all I've ever done. So I really got curious about it because I also noticed that when people were making this style of bread, they were always able to make it more beautiful. The scoring patterns looked better. The loaves looked very, like they had this bubbly crust. And when they cut into them, I saw big holes. And so I really was determined to figure out what it was. Now, if you remember back, when was that? Back in episode 77, I had Angela from Axe and Root Homestead on the blog and she was talking about a few tips on making sourdough bread that really were completely new to me, like chilling it before you did the scoring pattern. I forget what else she said, probably all the things that I've now learned. So this new way is actually really easy. It intimidated me a bit at first because it was just a learning curve. I didn't really know the whole process or how to do it but now I have done it so many times that it's really simple. I'm going to start experimenting with using maybe einkorn flour, all whole wheat, and seeing how the process works out. But for now, I just did a combination of unbleached organic bread flour, unbleached organic all-purpose flour, and some freshly milled flour that I made here at home. So let me read to you the recipe that I'm doing and then explain the process. 
Okay, so I start with 500 grams of unbleached all-purpose flour. Now, the reason I'm going in grams is I wanted this process to turn out like all of the bread I saw online, and everybody I read that was doing it was going with the kitchen scale. And I wasn't really sure which part of this process was optional or which part was actually gonna make it yield better results. So the first time I did it, I actually got on Josh Weissman's YouTube channel and completely followed his method to a T. And he does this thing where first he makes a Levain and then he lets that sit out for several hours and then he measures different flowers. And I followed it to a T. And then I dropped one part of his process to see, was that the crucial thing that made the bread so much better whenever I followed his? And then I drop another thing. And I feel like I finally figured out which things I could eliminate because I always like something simple. Whereas if it, if it requires making a Levain ahead of time, that's just another step. If it's gonna yield a better result, I'm great with that. But if it, it's not, then I want to actually figure out if I can just get away with not doing that. So I decided that that part was definitely optional and I eliminated a few other things. I tried once without any of the bread flour and I didn't get as good of a result. I also tried going straight in with some sourdough starter from the refrigerator, not freshly fed, and I couldn't really tell much of a difference. So here is the process that I have pared down. So 500 grams of unbleached all purpose, 200 grams of freshly ground whole wheat, 250 grams of bread flour. I just use a postage scale because my hands look huge on this because I have my wide angle zoom lens on. Um, I just use a postage scale because that's what I have and I just press tear in between each flour so that it goes back to zero and then I can just add to it. To that, I add 650 grams of water and then allow it to sit and soak up all the water I, again, I don't really know that this part is necessary. So if you don't have a lot of time, you could go straight in to adding 200 grams of mature starter and 20 grams of salt. Now this next part is the part that makes all the difference. So allow it to rest for about 30 minutes and then start doing these stretch and folds. This is where you pull the dough up away from the bowl and then set it back down. You rotate the bowl and you do this all the way around. If you watch Ballerina Farm over on Instagram, you will see her doing this all the time. I always saw her doing it and I wasn't sure which part of the process that was supposed to happen. I didn't know if that was kneading. Well, that's all, there is no kneading. So after you do six stretch and folds, you allow it to bulk ferment for anywhere from three to 12 hours. Then you cut it in half shape it into two balls, allow it to sit out to develop a little bit of a skin, flip it over, shape it, add it to a banditon basket, and then allow it to rise overnight in the fridge. This is crucial. This is what yields a beautiful result, and I really still am not sure why. It somehow just makes the outside perform better. It gives it this crusty crust with this really fluffy, soft interior. I have found that this part is really crucial. Now, it's a little bit tricky because you have to, if you want bread tomorrow morning, you need to think about it this morning. So if you want it to rise overnight in the fridge, even with a really active starter, it's just going to be really slow. So anyways, I love this method. This is the way that I'm going to be making bread from here on out. It's really so simple and once you have the recipe memorized, it isn't something that you have to think through, like when's the next stretch and fold? When's the shaping part? It's actually only a few steps once you have it all memorized. So that is something that I've been doing lately in my kitchen. I've been having so much fun practicing different scoring patterns. Everything I try ends up looking pretty because when it chills overnight, it just develops this really beautiful skin. And when you cut into it with a scoring razor, it almost always looks pretty and it always tastes delicious. So you can head over to the blog farmhouseonboon.com and get that official recipe and process or visit the YouTube channel. It's coming out on Tuesday, so March 
9th and I promise you it'll be the best bread you've ever had in your life. <laughs> that's how I feel about it. So making sourdough bread with stretching and folding, that's the first thing. The next is I am learning about copper pots and pans. This is something that I knew nothing about except for that I thought all of the copper pans I saw hanging in people's kitchens were really beautiful, but I didn't really know exactly the ins and outs of cooking with them and I still really don't, but I have done some research and I've ordered some copper pots and pans from a seller on Etsy. I actually found someone who has them very reasonably priced. They're made in Texas, so made in the USA, and they have the all the benefits of cooking with copper, the even heat distribution. So let me give you a quick rundown on at least what I know, and then I'll be updating you later on how they cook. So the reason that, first of all, I became interested in copper pans because I love my cast iron. I really don't need copper pans, but I also felt like I needed a few saucepans because I have one large saucepan, no small ones, and there are just certain times when you're making something liquid where you would like a nice little saucepan. So I had one stainless steel. And the, to be honest, the main reason is we are working on our pantry makeover. So just two days ago, our cabinet maker who we hired last July, he's been way behind, finally came in and put in the cabinets in our pantry. And so we're going to be painting it. I have a whole bunch of plans for that pantry. So I'll be sharing more about that soon. But one of the things I wanted is when you first walk into the pantry, I wanted the back wall to be a pot rail with hanging copper pots. And so I thought that would be really pretty. I thought also I could use a few and if nothing else, they would just look really gorgeous. So I wanted to learn a little bit about them because I could have just gotten some copper pots at the antique shop, but I didn't really want to hang them in there if they weren't going to also be useful in our kitchen. So I wanted them to be something that we could also actually use. And that's what started me on this research. So I learned that there are a couple of like really prominent brands, but the key things that you want to know is copper is beneficial because it evenly distributes heat. So if you've ever cooked a pancake and it's half cooked on one side and not the other, apparently with copper, it will be cooked, the entire pan will heat up at the same temperature. Again, I don't really struggle with this with my cast iron, but that is one of the advantages. And again, these will be used sparingly. We will still be using cast iron most of the time, but I am excited to incorporate copper. Now you can either get stainless steel lined copper pots and pans, or you can get tin lined. And apparently the way it's traditionally done is they are tinned and they're meant to be maintained. So if the tin wears away and you start to see copper, you get them re-tinned and it's not as durable. So tin line means that you can't use stainless steel scrubbers. You have to be a little bit more delicate with them, but it maintains all of the advantages of cooking with copper, whereas stainless steel will make it to where the copper underneath won't really maintain the heat distribution because it will have to go through the very heavy stainless steel. I ended up going with the tinned because this is what that seller had on Etsy. I wanted the more traditional French experience of cooking with copper for the times when I do do that. So we'll see how it goes. I'm planning to not use stainless steel scrubbers. I also learned that you never heat up a copper pot or pan empty. So you have to have fat or liquid in it. So I already warned um, my one of my daughters is the cook in this kitchen. And I warned my husband because the three of us cook the most not to treat this like you would treat cast iron because it's completely opposite. With cast iron, you have to preheat it empty or you won't, you'll have something will stick to it. So it's completely the opposite. I have a feeling somebody's probably gonna ruin my copper pots and pans whenever they don't realize that, but I have already told them, no preheating on the copper pots and pans. So I'll let you know more on how that goes, but I am excited to get them and try them. I will update you, but those are the few things that I've learned about them so far. Now you can get antique copper pots and pans. You just most likely, in order to use them, would have to make sure that they're retinned because most likely they're not going to be in good condition. So I didn't really know how expensive that would be. So that's why I went with this. Uh, his name is on Etsy. It's called Shane Copper. 
Okay, the next thing I've learned is rendering fat. Now this should not be revolutionary for me, but it's just one of those things I've never done. We make bone broth, we ferment. I've never rendered fat. I mostly just use butter and coconut oil, occasional olive oil, but coconut oil and butter are our preferred fats. And I was reading in my friend, Dr. Ashley Turner's Restorative Kitchen Cookbook on rendering fat. And this is great because if you buy meat from local farmers, there are parts that the butcher doesn't really use. Like for example, chicken feet, they're really good in bone broth. You don't wanna discard those. And normally I think they get thrown away. So that's a way that you can redeem that and use that. It gives gelatin to the bone broth. Well, fat again is something that will Mo not all of it because some of it will go with the cuts, but some of it will get thrown away and you can request that from the butcher. So like last time I ordered meat, I also got a bag of fat. And the way you do it is you just put it into a pot with the lid on. So I used my stainless steel, the one saucepan I have, which this makes me wonder how it would do in copper, probably would do well. And cook it till it sizzles off, strain it off and then just return it to the heat and keep doing that until all the fat cooks out. You strain it off with a fine mesh strainer and you'll have a hard white fat left over that you can use for cooking. So I do this in a way with bacon. Whenever I cook bacon, I will strain off any solids and just keep a little jar of bacon fat next to the stove and then cook with that for the next few days. It's the same way, but you can do it with any fat. So it seems really obvious, really easy. I just hadn't done it and I've been enjoying rendering fat lately. Okay, the next thing is kamut, um, kamut grain. The reason I got into this was a friend from our old church bought a 50 pound bag of kamut from Azure Standard that they just weren't using. She said, we have, we've had this for a couple of years, we're not using it, would you want it? And I was like, I always take free food. I'll either give it to the goats, the chickens, or we will eat it, we'll find a way to prepare it. So I bought the, I'm trying to see if I can see it here. My camera is actually resting on books instead of using a tripod. So it's probably in this pile, but the Kamut cookbook by the Food Nanny. So it's called For the Love of Kamut. I purchased it and we have been using a lot of her recipes. So I have my grain mill and we've been milling the Kamut. We made her Kamut pretzels. We made one of her coffee cake recipes. So what I've gathered from Kamut and what I've done a little bit of research on on why you would want to use Kamut is it's not hybridized. So like einkorn, it's an ancient grain that hasn't been changed repeatedly over the years. It can be used as a one-to-one -one replacement for whole wheat flour. But like I said, that cookbook that I got has Kamut specific recipes. Now, if you, if you get the bran out, which I never have made an all-purpose flour at home, so if you wanna buy like an all-purpose kamut, that is how you would do all-purpose. So you could also do that. Just like with einkorn, you can do the all-purpose einkorn, or if you include the entire grain, you can just mill it at home. It has less gluten and is easier to digest, so similar to einkorn in that way. It has less calories, carbs than modern wheat and more protein and fiber. So it's actually a lot healthier. A lot of times people who can't tolerate gluten can tolerate it. Now it wouldn't be advisable for people with celiac because it does still have gluten, but it is more tolerable, digestible. It also has a really unique flavor. So it just, it has more flavor than regular all-purpose flour. So that's been something we've been experimenting new with here in the kitchen, brand new. I've only made a couple of things. So again, I'll have to update you. I still am doing a lot with einkorn. Anytime I can't sour something, I will use einkorn, but I probably will be incorporating kamut a lot for that as well. Okay, and the last thing, and this one is just silly, but I normally order meat in bulk whenever the meat I have before is getting low. And I have done this so many times since we've moved into this house that I have just little bits left from several different orders. 
And so I'm trying to get through it all before I order more and it's getting there. I have very little left, but I'm having to work through a lot of the cuts that you just, you know, those cuts that you are sick of that you really just don't really like. And so one of the ways I've been doing that is using my meat grinder and turning some of the cuts that aren't ground, but that would, you know, you can kind of make meat disappear into a recipe if you grind it. I'm turning cuts that you would normally grind into ground meat, but then another is we have a lot of roasts. And normally I make my roast in the Instant Pot with carrots and onions. I make a little gravy and mashed potatoes and we have that very hearty, full country meal of roast and mashed potatoes and gravy. But we are sick of it. We had so many roasts and we're all just kind of over that roast meal. And so the other day I put the roast in my Instant Pot with a ton of cumin, chili powder, garlic powder, onion powder, and salt, and just a lot, just liberal handfuls of it. First, actually, I seared it in olive oil. Then I put all those spices, and then I added about a cup of water and cooked it on high for an hour, and then just shredded it, and it is the best taco meat. So now I wish we had like 10 more roasts because that's the only way I want to eat it now. I just feel like also, as the days are getting a little bit warmer and longer, you're wanting more of that fresh taste. So like a taco with greens and raw onions and guacamole, as opposed to a heavy meal like mashed potatoes and meat and gravy. And so this has just been a really good way to prepare it. So my fifth thing that I've learned recently or that I've been doing differently in the kitchen is you can make roast into taco meat. And I don't know why that is not, that's probably obvious to everyone. I just always have prepared roast that way and never thought about it as a taco meat. Normally taco meat to me is steak, chicken, or ground meat. I'm not sure why it's not roast because it's probably the best taco meat I've had. All right, well, I hope that you enjoyed this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast five new things that I'm doing slash learning in my kitchen. Make sure to check out my free blogging success masterclass at bit.ly forward slash farmhouse blogging school. And as always, thank you so much for listening and I will see you in episode 88.